That's the only thing. And some of them are like, oh, okay. yeah. Because what I do when you give me this, I copy this. And I start to copy it because it's the only thing. So that when Jenny Coon goes to Audubon, excuse me, it'll be April when he gets back. Your summary and, and what I've been on are all for the yeah, and on some other folks, and part of our analysis, you had folks that were out and had to pay for it. So anyway, but I, it's at the end of the day, but I, but I, and today I'm going to tell you
And I think that is all the announcements that I have uh, for today, other than I should encourage you to come to fellowship after church uh, in Asbury Hall. But my wife made pie, so I get the leftovers. So if you don't show up and eat the pie, <laughs> no, I really don't need I don't need the pie. So come come and, and eat the eat the pie that she made. Um, she said she baked it for my birthday, but I have to share it, so that's the downside, I guess. All right, now let us center our hearts and minds on God as we listen to the prayer that was prepared for us. Dear Father in heaven, we give you praise and thanksgiving this day. We are thankful for those who protect us, who lay their lives on the line, who act as Christ acted for us. Lord, we remember all those that we have lost in the line of duty and those who have been lost in the war against terrorism and especially those who lost loved ones on 9-11. Lord God, we just ask that you are here with us as we worship you in a nation that is free to worship our risen Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now stand with me as we sing our first hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, hymn number 400. Oh, oh, oh. 
87 to 85 as we read our Psalter lesson for this morning, which is Psalm 51, verses 1 through 5. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sins that are before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sins and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was born into iniquity, and I have been sinful since my The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. You may be seated. Good morning, Mount Pepper. This morning I'm reading from 1 Timothy, 1st chapter, 12 through the 17th verses. I am grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners in whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy so that in me as the foremost, Christ Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, and the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson for this morning comes from Luke 15, verses 1 through 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who did not repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and she loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house to search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Dear God, let your words be spoken and heard today through this sermon and through this worship service. Amen. 
So last week we examined the book of uh, Philemon, and we saw how Onesimus was set free, not only from his slavery, but free from his sin. So the Holy Spirit had led him to Paul, who in turn, Paul leads him to Christ. And so today, we're looking at another letter from the Apostle Paul, this time to his young pupil, uh, Timothy. So Paul understood the freedom that comes from that amazing grace that sets us free. Paul, writing to Timothy, ex explains the feeling of being set free and how God uses someone like him, someone who was feared by the Roman church, because Paul was actively hunting them down and persecuting them. He was putting to death those who proclaimed to be followers of Christ. So some of you might be familiar with Paul's <coughs> conversion story, but for those who may not be as familiar, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Acts in the, chapter, in the 22nd chapter. And here, in the book of Acts, we are given more of Paul's testimony than what was read this morning. So Acts 22, verse 1, Paul says this. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cecilia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death. So now we, we see here, Paul refers to the church as the way, and this is what the church, uh, when they started, called themselves, because Jesus was the way to salvation, he was the way to God. So that's why we see here in Acts, the way being capitalized, because it was the name of the early church. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? We're familiar with that verse. It ends, no one comes to the Father except through me. So if you are a follower of Christ, you are following in the way of Jesus. And the way, the Christian church, would have been familiar with who Paul was and what his intentions were, as we see here as we continue in Acts 22. Verse 4. Paul was arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can testify, I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. At noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So we know that Paul was blinded by Jesus, and that encounter with Jesus led him to repent and be baptized by Ananias. And Jesus gave him his ordination to pastor those he once persecuted. Could you imagine that? The pastor who the Methodist Church sends you was the guy that was your number one enemy. He was trying to tear the church apart. Paul was probably one of the worst and vile of all sinners, if we think about it, in our 
human minds. One whom Jesus would have been guilty of sitting with and showing mercy on. Paul was a good religious person in the eyes of the Jews. And he thought what he was doing was justified. He needed to stamp out this church because of what it was doing to the world. So if there was anyone who would step into church that would make people say, what are they doing here? It definitely would be this man. He probably would have made people run away in fear. The early church, the way, they knew who he was and what he did. And Timothy, who Paul is writing this letter to, which we read, which was read this morning, knew who Paul was. The other apostles knew what Paul had done. Paul himself here in 1 Timothy knew what he did by saying, I was once a blasphemer and persecutor and a violent man. And he calls himself the worst of all sinners. Paul not only didn't believe in Jesus, he hated what Jesus stood for. He was a zealot. He was willing to take the lives of Christians he hated Jesus' followers. He was blinded by his own sin and hatred. He was a wretched sinner. And yet, God saw that Paul was worthy of being a shepherd. Paul was worthy that Jesus would leave the flock and risk his own life to find the one in need of saving. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for people like Paul. And Paul was like a lost coin, one which some would consider unworthy of saving. Yet Jesus saw him worthy of turning the house upside down to find. Jesus died for Paul just as much as he took on the sins of each one of us. He allowed himself to be nailed to a cross. Jesus died for all of those who were like Paul, who were the worst sinners of all. God showed Paul mercy. God's grace and, over, and overflowing love for us is shown on the cross. And because of it, Paul's faith and love in Christ grew, just as our faith and love can grow. If Jesus can change the worst of all sinners, then he can change each one of us as well. I know that Jesus changed me and often I am confronted with that fact that I, too, can see myself as the worst of all sinners. He can change men and women no matter what their background is. And this is a debate that I get into sometimes uh, with friends and, and, and people that I meet. Uh, it's one that, that we had not a couple of weeks ago with my sister-in-law, who works for a nursing home that takes care of some of the worst violent criminals that there are. And it's hard to see that God would love people like that. But I told my sister-in-law, you know, you really are showing the love of Christ, the fact that these people are criminals, but they're in need of nursing care. And there's someone there that is helping them. And surely we would think those people deserve a punishment. 
And I think we are giving it to them on this earth, but Jesus even paid the price for those people. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around that. The fact that Jesus would love so much that he would even forgive the worst of all criminals that we can think of. But Jesus died for those people too. And we are reminded of this when we sing the hymn Amazing Grace. Because God changed a man named John Newton. Amazing Grace is the most well-known hymns, and it actually, I saw this uh, a couple of years ago, and I'm sure it's still true, that it topped the list of favorite hymns of Christians and non-Christians. And it was written by John Newton. Newton's mother intended for him to become a minister. But life took Newton in a different direction. Instead of becoming a minister, he would join the Royal Navy. And then he would renounce his belief in God. And then he would become a captain of a slave ship. And as a captain, he was notorious among the sailors as being the most profane ship captain there was. And yet, after his conversion into a Christian, he wrote one of the most well-known hymns today. So when we sing it, we can see how someone so wretched could write such powerful words. We can hear the music in our minds without even hearing it play. And if you're like me, you might walk around and sing Amazing Grace a cappella. But in the, that tune, we can hear the groanings of those who were enslaved, which he would have heard on the ship as it made many journeys to England and to America. Surely he reflected back on his sinful life, sin that almost took his own life, sin that flowed out of his mouth with profane words and wretched deeds, sin that would have chained up Africans to be sold into the bondage of slavery. He would have known the pain and suffering because he was the one inflicting pain and suffering and death on those that he was sailing around the world. John Newton would go on to encourage a young William Wilberforce not only to become a Christian and know Christ personally, but also he encouraged William to live for Christ and fight against the slave trade in the British Empire. And a few years ago, there was a movie that was based on William Wilberforce that was called Amazing Grace. And it is a, an excellent movie if you haven't seen it. I'd encourage you to, to look for it. Because we see Jesus change the lives of sinful people. Jesus changed John Newton just as he changed the Apostle Paul. These men who were seen as evil and sinful and the most wretched of all. And if God can do that, certainly he can change you and I. I often look at myself and ask, how can God use me? He knows me. He knows my sins. He knows my past. He knows that I am guilty and deserving of punishment. Yet his grace is sufficient to cover even me. And we see that Jesus died for all people, not just a select few. Those people that we want to see get theirs or get what's coming to them, he died for those people too. 
And yet the power of the love of Jesus extends even further than most people who have wronged us. It is hard to fathom the amount of sin that Jesus took on when he went to the cross. But he changed our lives for the better. He changed the world. And this, this past week, one of my, my former, former youth uh, kids posted on Facebook a quote from Alice in Wonderland, and I saw it and I thought, what a wonderful way to sum up our scripture today. Lewis Carroll wrote this in, in Alice in Wonderland. I can't go back to yesterday because I was a different person then. You see, Jesus came to be an example for us, to care for people and show that he loved us. But Jesus came also to save the sinners. His mercy and grace covers us. It changes us. We can't go back to who we were yesterday because that's not who we are today. In Christ, we are made new. Through salvation, we are changed. Our past is our past. And Jesus makes today a new day. We cannot go back because through Jesus we are called a new creation. To some, like the religious leaders, we see who are angry here in the Gospel of Luke that I read. This idea that sinners can be made new through believing in Jesus' death and resurrection is one that is hard to comprehend. We might ask ourselves, how can God love someone like me? Or how can God love someone like them? C.S. Lewis said, the Christian does not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. In Jesus, we are made new. And we see that in Paul, who was a persecution, persecutor of Christians, but would become one of the greatest pastors of all times. And we see that in a slave ship captain, who would become instrumental in ending the British slave trade. If the love, mercy, and grace of God can change those people, then what can he do for you? Paul is telling us that God saves sinners. He is in the business of saving sinners. Jesus tells us that even though we might ourselves see ourselves as unworthy, he sees us as worthy. Jesus sat with sinners and dined with them he was willing to be the shepherd, finding even the one who runs furthest from him. He is willing to search for that lost coin, which others would probably see as worthless and not worth the time. Jesus was willing to die for those whom the world sees as unworthy. Jesus sees each of you as worthy, worthy of mercy and grace, that amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. So let us rejoice because we were once were lost, but now we are found. Our chains are gone and we have been set free, saved from our bondage by an eternal king, an immortal, invisible God, through an eternal, eternal covenant by Jesus' atonement for our sins. Amen. <clears throat> now let us turn and give God praise for our joys and share our concerns with each other. Let us pray together. 
Lord God, I thank you for this wonderful weekend that I got to have with my wife and our dog uh, as we celebrated my birthday. I thank you for all of the joy and the, the comments that were shared and the messages I got. Lord, I thank you. Give you thanks for this church that is filled this morning with people with open hearts and open ears. Lord, we give you thanks for the rain. And we give you thanks for the blessings in our lives. Lord God, we also lift up to you our concerns. We lift those up who are on our minds today. We lift up Jeannie and Jerry Metz, Gloria and Bob Eves, Susan, Ronnie, all of those who we lost on 9-11. We lift up Jen Burdett and Judy Hogan, Louise Shipley, Billy Little, Bruce Weatherly, Donna Draper, Ken and Jean Klein, Donna Klein, Ron Palmer, Joe Young, Ann, Mary, Dale Hurley, Wanda, Louise Miller. Lord God, we lift up all who are on our hearts today and all those concerns that we have in our lives, the ones that we share with you and others and the ones that we keep to ourselves. We know that you hear all of our prayers. Lord God, we thank you for our Savior, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we us not into temptation. Now let us stand and sing that hymn that was written by such a wretched person, a sinner. Stand and sing with the amazing grace, number 378.
Now let us worship God through the giving of our tithes and offerings as the ushers come forward. <coughs>
the church go forth and share your testimony like Paul. Rejoice because you have been found by a merciful God. Rejoice because God's grace is amazing. His mercy has covered you. And he has saved you. Amen. Amen.